We're going to have some workshops to hear from more members of our community because one of the issues with reentry is that everyone's story is different. The prison system and the criminal justice system likes to reduce people down to this one moment where they were convicted. It likes to reduce people down to a rap sheet or a statistic, but we know that's not the case. Every person who has a record is a human being with a story and with a family and with people who need them in their lives. So we want to hear more from people. We're going to have a Community Voices panel coming up. So thank you very much, and we're going to move on to the Community Voices panel. I'd like to introduce uh, Watani Steiner again as our moderator, and um, come on up. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to try to uh, engage into a dialogue or some kind of conversation, and hopefully we can have uh, some, well, we will have some questions. So it's a matter of time management. So uh, let me just start off real quickly. Um, what I want to do is to have everyone sort of introduce themselves, you know, uh, name, age, how long you've been in prison, just some basic stuff and what you're doing now. And I have a, a question that I'm going to pose first so we can get started. So just a matter of an introduction, you can do a brief introduction, and then I'll give you the first question to move on. So I start with mm -hmm. My name is Ursula Young. I represent the Gamma Institute. I am the assistant director of the program for the Street Scholars and the peer mentor program here at Mary College. My experiences is I did tw 26 years in prison, five on parole. Uh, I'm off parole now, and uh, pretty much, uh, let's bring it. Great. I'm Tanasha Stevens. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Tanasha Stevens. Um, I am a single mother, been out of prison for 13 years, went to prison for six times, altogether 10 years. That may not seem like a lot, but for me, it was a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, I'm with a program called New Dream at College of Alameda. Mm -hmm. And um, that's it. <laughs> that's great. Hi, everybody, and thank you for having us here today and for being with us. My name is Alejandra Landin. Uh, I am 31 years of age. I was involved in the criminal justice system for six and a half years, and I currently uh, have a post as a staff of the Restoring Our Communities Initiative, which is a new program at Laney College, uh, and I am the equity specialist there at Laney. Good morning, everybody. My name is Anthony Landers. I'm representing the underground, Berkeley Underground Scholars. Um, I grew up here in the Bay Area. Um, I grew up inside a juvenile hall over here in Alameda County, 150 crew. Um, I spent six years of my life in prison, starting when I was 17. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with y'all today. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to start off by asking a well, first question, just to get, so you can sort of tie it in with uh, what we start off with. Early in my presentation, I told you all that the biggest difficulty I encountered when I first got home was rebuilding relationship with my children. So my uh, question to you, first question to you is to, to the panelists, how would you uh, ask that, let me ask that same question. What would each of you say is the biggest challenge you faced when you were released from prison? Let me start with you. The biggest challenge that I had after I got released from prison, uh, I'm gonna say adapting. It's funny, you know, you, prison is it's, it's hard. <laughs> and uh, for me, it's either you're gonna be hard or soft in prison. I'm not gonna go into all the details of the story of how to do time, because that's not what we're here for. Mm -hmm. So when I stepped outside the wall, when, they, when I initially got outside the wall and they actually said that you have some sense of freedom, right? I was lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really needed support from every angle, right? But I'm very fast at observing how to adapt in situations. But my thing was I had this thing inside of me that they know who I am. Mm -hmm. They know where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. 
But it wasn't like that. I remember, because they didn't give me no shoes and nothing because I had got released by the courts. So I had like some shoes that didn't have no bottoms on, some ragged pants, an old ragged shirt because they had to get me out of the system. <laughs> So first thing I wanted to do was kind of like change my character, but they wanted to go into Popeye Chicken, and I didn't want to go in there like that, right? Mm -hmm. And they were like, nobody ain't gonna know who you is. And that was the first time I got a sense of, I can actually be out here in society and start to adapt me without having that pressure on me. So I had, that was the biggest challenge, to get that pressure out of myself Great. and realize that ain't nobody concerned with mm -hmm. my life, yeah. that I can actually live, I can yeah. actually breathe, and I can actually move forward. Right. That was the biggest challenge for me. Great, thank you. Yes, uh-huh, okay. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a parent. So my biggest, biggest challenge was learning how to not be in prison. Learning how to communicate with my children. Learning how to, to, um, I don't know, live life without, being locked up, you know, any amount of time you do, you adapt to your environment. And I had to learn how to eat slower. I had to learn how to sleep longer. I had to learn how to, to respect myself more. Because when you're coming out of prison, it, you, you getting released doesn't release all the things that you have learned while being in prison. You have to learn how to be a citizen, learn how to be productive, learn how to, everything has to change because you get adapted to that mm -hmm. system. I was, I was adapted to waking up at four in the morning mm -hmm. and, and I was adapted to going to work for eight cents an hour. Mm -hmm. And I was adapted to eating in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. you know, I was adapted to hearing those doors clink shut. Mm -hmm. So my biggest challenge was to get unadapted to that. For me, when I was released, I'd say that the biggest struggle was actually an extension of my experiences prior to incarceration, uh, which kind of in a general sense was decolonizing my mind. What do I mean by that? So while you're incarcerated, as was said earlier by Mr. Steiner, that's an extension of the new Jim Crow. All the power structure that happens uh, to us and the control that's put over us and our lack of being able to consent about how we eat, what we do, how we move, what we do with our bodies, all of those things while we're in prison, I got to know that what I had thought prior to my incarceration was success and was who I needed to be for other people was just part of my mind colonized to uh, looking to have a good job for material things, for those sorts of things that were told our success, right? So while I was in prison, my eyes were open to so much more of what that matrix of oppression is. And when I was released, it was my first time ever in life knowing that from all the broken pieces of what I had experienced and my breakdown, how was I gonna put myself back together and who was I gonna be and most importantly, why? And so that search for that why was the hardest thing for me uh, in wanting to recreate or create myself into someone without all those stigmas of being a person of color, of being a queer woman of color. Um, and so uh, I learned that the biggest struggle was finding how to practice social justice within myself and my family first and foremost before I could move on to doing any other kind of work in life that would be meaningful. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, very good. Very good. Echoing off uh, what the panel said, one of the major difficulties was adapting um, so I came home straight from the SHU, um, and it was a culture shock coming home. Everything was different. Um, and one of my biggest barriers was I wanted to get to higher education. I just didn't know how. Um, and before I could do that, I needed to establish myself financially. And it's difficult to do that when nobody will hire you. Um, you know, as a striker, um, convicted felon, it's, it, that was the main thing. And I wanted to live a righteous life. I was tired of lying. I was tired of always getting over. And, uh, but I had to lie in order to get employment. And so um, that was my biggest barrier, was getting employment. And then once I did get to education, I got to community college. I tested in at about a seventh, eighth grade level um, because of my, my poor educational system. 
And so I had to relearn everything um, that I thought I knew before that I didn't. And so that was that was big for me. That was that was the mm. hardest part. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That that plays into the pipeline from prison to employment and education rather than the other way around. So my next question, and uh, I want to pose, you can reflect on this a bit, and it's kind of long, let me see. What words of encouragement do you have for people in reentry and their loved ones? What words of wisdom or lessons that you've learned during your journey can you share as motivation and inspiration for people in reentry? Is that clear? Okay, great. We start with you. <laughs> uh, you want me to start the other way around? It doesn't make it. Okay, great. <laughs> Good. <sighs> For me, I have, I, I would have to actually speak on the experience I've just experienced. Uh, a lot of issues have been showing up for me in life that I didn't realize that I didn't have no ability to deal with. When you're in prison, you don't go to funerals. You don't have to deal with other people's problems. You don't have to really deal with family issues. You hear about them from a distance, like, you know, and it becomes, you become callous to it. It's almost like somebody passes and it just, it doesn't really affect you, but it does. It's nothing that you can do. You know you're not going to the funeral. You know you can't be a part of it. And that has been very difficult for me now that I'm actually experiencing these things in my life. And I was trying to tell somebody the other day, I say, I've never experienced it. I've never been through this. You know what I'm saying? I went to prison when I was 22 years old. I was, I was a hooligan in East Palo on the streets, running wild, thugging out, as they might say these days. But, uh, I didn't have no experience. I had never been in an apartment. I had never been married, you know what I'm saying? So all of these different things that people are supposed to learn as they grow through life, I had no ability to deal with. And now that I'm free and I'm actually having to deal with life and be a patriot to my family and to my organization and to my schooling and to myself, it's a lot of responsibility. And it weighs heavy on you, especially when you don't have the ability to really deal with the experience from the experience. So I'm just kind of like out there just filling it out as I go. And it gets very complicated. And the reason I say this is because sometimes my battery actually get drained and I need to plug into somebody. And I've always, and I've, one of the things that I've learned about the people that you plug in with, you have to plug in with the people that's associated with your same experiences. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to plug in with my own scholars. We've been able to create a unit, that family that still exists from the, from the system, it's a hidden, it's a hidden type of family that we have of communication. It's almost like this thing when you hear them say there's honor amongst convicts. We have a code of ethics that we understand, that we, we it's a, you have the liberty to understand it. We understand it. And back and forth from there, because they're going through the same issues of trying to adapt. I've only been out here five, five and a half years now, and it's, it's rough. It's rough mentally. You know, coming from the place that I came because I don't have these experiences in my life. And now that I'm experienced, I can't even go to funerals no more. I went to three funerals out here and I almost broke down. I'm like, I can't do it. It's just don't, I just don't have it in my blood. So I say all that to say, you know, <laughs> that's, perfect. that's where I'm at, you know, these experiences. So mm -hmm. I'm learning, you know, it's a learning process and I think we just have to continue to grow. Yeah. And, learn to deal with these issues, right? But these are some of the issues that I had to deal with because I was blindsided from them when I was young. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, that's really good. Same question about encouragement. That's, that would be a, yeah. So. Can you repeat the question? All right, let me read again. What words of encouragement do you have for people in reentry and their loved ones? So it's about encouragement. What words of wisdom or lesson <coughs> that you've learned during your journey can you share as motivation and inspiration for people in reentry. So the people that uh, you know are coming out, what 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 would you how would you pass them the that baton? Okay, so I will start by saying this because this is the most important thing that I had to learn for me to move forward. And that is don't let yourself stand in the way of yourself. <laughs> don't 
let your past determine your future. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm out of prison or just because I've been to prison doesn't mean that I have to be this, this, this bad person. Or it doesn't mean that I can't be the 4.0 student that I am today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I first stepped on the campus, was the same day I almost stepped off the campus because I felt intimidated. I felt like, I can't do this. I'm 44 years old, look at all these young people here on this campus. How can I fit in with them? How can I find my place trying to better myself and get a higher education? How can I show my children that this is the road that they need to take? And that, that question almost caused me to walk off campus because I felt so intimidated. Mm -hmm. But I didn't let that stop me. I didn't turn off that campus. I stayed on that campus. And I went through the steps that I needed to go through to get to where I am today. Right. So my best advice is, is, again, don't let your past determine your future. Mm -hmm. Because I'm in school right now for my children. I'm a proud mother of a 25-year-old, a 23-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Mm. And I beat myself up because I felt like I dropped the ball for my 23-year-old and my 25-year-old. Mm. Okay. Thank God they're on a positive path, but I can't take the credit for that mm. because I wasn't there. Mm. But my 10-year-old, I've been there from day one, and he needs to know that Achieving a higher education is the only way to go. It's the only way to be successful in your life and, and be fruitful and be able to give back to your community and be able to represent your community and your family one day. You have to go for a higher education. So me being on this campus, on my campus, and, and achieving straight A's and being a 4.0 student is showing my son that he can do it too. And that's what it's all about for me. Right. It's about showing my children that they can be better than me, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. So there are struggles. Nobody's going to tell you it's easy. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's easy, because it's not. But anything worth having is worth fighting for. I learned that. Mm -hmm. I may have took me time to learn it, a good 40 years, probably. Mm -hmm. But I got it. And so that's what I want to pass on to any single mother out there, any female out there that feels like they're alone trying to come to school. You're not alone. And I also want to say that sitting up here and telling you I've been incarcerated was a big step for me. So in doing so, I hope that if there's another female out there, another single mother, another mother out there that, that is having these struggles and, and, and feeling like they're alone, you're not alone. I'm here. That's what I want to say. So in terms of words of encouragement and support that I would provide, not only the person themselves who was incarcerated physically, but also their families who also do time with us, right, when we're incarcerated, uh, I'd say the most important thing is, again, like I said earlier, that social justice and that healing, for me, has proven to be so essential to begin at home, right? The t-shirt I have on today, you may not be able to see it, but it says beyond the bars. And I received that at a conference I went to, and the reason I'm pointing that out is because the question that was just posed made me really think about the fact that there are many ways of being incarcerated, not just behind physical bars. At home, our families are incarcerated with the stigma of certain things that we think uh, 
are sources of shame that we shouldn't talk about uh, within our families or within uh, society you know, at large. Uh, and so that, that is one of the most important things that I would uh, encourage families uh, to talk about when a person comes back to their community is those things within the family that have been something that they couldn't talk about sources that you know at home there was a saying that you know de eso no se habla which translates to oh you don't talk about that that's just an issue we don't talk about right but silence is violence as well and so that would be first and foremost for the family uh, what I would encourage them to do is go home you know sunlight is the best disinfectant I was once told so talk about those things and you know that can be a point of launching off uh, for everyone in the family, in particular the person who's been incarcerated, to be able to recognize in themselves that they do have the potential and you know, to be an extraordinary uh, human in all aspects, right? Because being a person who's been incarcerated is just, is just part of our humanity um, and while we're incarcerated and also from the communities we come from of color, right, our resources, our right to our basic resources is denied. Uh, and, and that's another way in which our ability to consent about our life decisions is taken from us right away, just by virtue of where we grew up, what family we were born to, and the system that has divested our own basic resources from us. Uh, so uh, another point that I would uh, tell uh, a family uh, concerning support and encouragement is that the word empowerment is something that we don't need to ask permission to have. I hear the word empowerment a lot and sometimes I shy away from the word or I have trepidation toward the word because who is giving you that empowerment, right? To me, that can sometimes be still a point of oppression or a system over you process where unless someone gives you empowerment, then does that mean you aren't capable of having it for yourself? And I say, no, it's more a matter of people get out of my way. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have the power within ourselves to create spaces of support for each other. Um, because as I was once told, if we're not at the table, then we're on the menu. And as people of color, that's something that historically has been happening to us from millennia in, in this country for centuries since before the colonies became what we now know as the United States. Uh, so those are the points that I would really um, use to really you know, guide families uh, and to tell them that your plans to invite them to think of their plans, not as a map, right? Because a lot of things happen through us, to us throughout our lives. And so if it's not on the map, you know, what happens then, right? If you only had plan A. So to think of it more of a, as a compass, right? And as earthy, and as everyone up here has said, you know, when you find people who are supportive and who are willing to disclose to you as well, really hone in on those resources and uh, be each other's social capital, right? Because that, that has a lot more power than money to be each other's social capital and that resource that, um, you know, is usually denied from us. But once we're here, especially in higher education, which has also been historically denied from us, and we become the gatekeepers, then you know there's really no stopping us. Thank you. Thank you. So words of wisdom and encouragement. Um, the first thing I want to talk about it was touched on by the panel was community. Um, throughout each part of this journey that we're going on, Finding community is going to hold you together. It's going to hold you there. Um, going to UC Berkeley, um, stepping into that institution, like you said, I, I immediately wanted to drop out and leave um, because you don't feel that in certain spaces. But having a space like Berkeley Underground Scholars, that, that, that unity, that fact that we can collectively share where we've been and build together. And so having community is important. And if there is no community, build that community. Um, that's, that's what we're here for, right? A lot of us are first generation, low income, formerly incarcerated students. So even if there is no community there, then that's perfect opportunity to build community and reach down to the next individual that's stepping up to where you're at. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about was um, um, throughout, the, throughout the institution, there's systematic barriers, systematic oppression um, at every level. And so being hungry for knowledge, knowledge of your education, knowledge of the systematic barriers, and knowledge of the resources that are available to you. Um, 
a lot of the resources we don't know about because they're not offered to us or they're, they're held back purposely. And so with this coalition, with all these services right here, we can collectively build and share those resources so that collectively we can overcome those barriers, those systematic barriers that are put there in place. And um, that's, that's the whole key with building community and seeking knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Waste some time now. Huh? More? Before? No. Okay. Let me, let me. Okay. Okay. Got one more. more question. Trying to gauge this time factors because we definitely want to uh, get some questions from, uh, from you out in the audience. Uh, let me put this question. Uh, we're there. I got several. Let me pick any, many, many. This one. Okay. Were there things you encountered while in prison that helped you maintain those relationships? Were there things in prison that you encountered that helped you to uh, uh, maintain your relationships? Relationships. Yeah, basically family or uh, you know any programs or any uh, any kind of system because I know you know I the mean, barriers with. Yeah, honestly, with me. Yeah. When I first went in the system, I was literally just rot inside. I was bitter. I was hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't snatch my whole life from me. I was my woman, my kid, you know, every, I was bitter. Mm -hmm. So the first, the first 10 years I was in prison, I was very violent. Mm -hmm. The first, when I got to the yard, very first day, and I didn't even know what a hole was. I just knew they was moving me around from cell to cell, but they was taking me to the hole. Mm -hmm. I had went to the hole three times in a row, because every time I came out of cell, I swung on somebody. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Man, it was flashing me back a little mm -hmm. bit. It was a rough journey. I had to come into myself somewhere down the line, though, and I think it was after I seen a lot of individuals going home, mm -hmm. and I realized that I was kind of like there by myself, mm -hmm. and I had, I had to continue this journey without them, because when I first went in, all the people that I knew from the street, we was all in the system. Mm -hmm. It was like one big party, mm -hmm. you know? We was fighting and, you know, drinking and smoking and doing whatever we could, you know what I'm saying, to make the day go past. We wasn't trying to be productive. And later on, I realized that, hey, I got to change something here. I can't live like this for the rest of my life. I can't just continue to do this. And that's when I started investing into myself, education, trades, things that would elevate me. I started reading, because I'm kind of like a little self-taught. I'm still learning how to mm -hmm. learn, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a real right. kind of like troublesome situation for me. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know. that's good, yeah. Uh, the same question. The reason why I say the question, just sort of try to frame it, is that, you know, while you're in prison, something, some light or something comes on at some point. Either somebody comes to you or maybe a program has been offered, and, you know, and then you have to figure out what you do when you get out. Because, you know, being outside, it's hard to live in a horror house and not turn a trick, even if you go in there with the best of intentions. But it's the same thing. So what, what turned around uh, in prison? What, can I, can I say something? I got a little story on you. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no you got a brief one, go ahead. Okay, real quick. What turned it around for me? Yeah. The police took my tele television. Mm -hmm. And I was so mad. You know? Oh, I said, <laughs> I said the COs had took my, it was a floating television. Somebody let you borrow a television. It wasn't mine. They took it out of my cell. And I literally went mad. You took my television. You know what I'm saying? And I was so frustrated in that cell, I literally had got to the point I had stripped down completely butt naked in the cell. And I'm standing in the cell mad, just frustrated. And I said, what is it that I have in here? And I realized I didn't have nothing in there because I didn't come in with nothing. When I came through the door, they stripped me down butt naked. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what is I'm going to get up out of this? And then it just clicked on me. I said, anything I take out of prison that's going to be mine is right here because they don't have no control of it. So I could turn this into a whole day uh, event <laughs> if I tell my whole story. So I'm going to try and break it down for you. I'm sitting in prison. I'm sitting in county jail. And everyone tells me, you got to find the baddest person in prison and beat them up. And you ain't going to have no problems because I'm scared to death of going to prison. So I did just that. I ran into this lifer. And we were playing racquetball. And she started calling me fat this and fat that. And I told her if she did it again, I was going to hit her. And I hit her with the racket in my hand. 
So I gave her 56 stitches right here. So I went to the hole for the remainder of my three years I spent in the hole. Well, it was the hole inside the hole because I was in shoot. And during that time, um, I had already told myself that I was cutting myself off from the streets because I was being selfish. I didn't want, I didn't want nothing to do with the streets. I didn't want my, I didn't want no letters from home. I didn't want no phone calls. I needed to do my time. And I couldn't make it hard on myself by wishing I was on the streets or knowing what's going on on the streets and stressing more. So I was selfish with my time. I did my time by myself. Until one day my mother came to see me. At this time I was six months to the gate being paroled. I was six months from being paroled and I was finally let out of shoe. So I was back on the main yard and my mother came to see me and I, re I rejected her visit. And she sent the COs back and she kept calling to have me come up there and I refused to go. And the third time the CO came to me and she said, what's wrong with you? That's your mother. And I said, Ann, it ain't your mother, so stay out of my business. Let me back in my room. She locked me back in my room and something heavy just got on my heart. And I went in the shower and I put a, a, a towel down and I start praying to my high report my higher power. And I asked him to open my heart and to, and, and, and to give me understanding of why I'm here. Why am I rejecting my mother? Why am I hurting myself more? I'm already in prison. I, everything has been taken from me. Why, why am I not allowing myself to visit my mother? And something happened. I was 19 years old. And something happened. I felt like I can't spend the rest of my life in prison. And I'm going to need help when I get out of prison. So I went to that visit and I seen my mother. And my mother let me know that she still loved me no matter that I was locked up, no matter that I had gotten myself in trouble and been incarcerated, that she still loved me. And when I came home, she would be there for me. It took me five more times of going to prison to actually believe that. But during the time I was in prison, I, I wanted to better myself, at least I thought I did. So I went to school, I got my GED, you know. Um, I started taking, I, I, got, I got certified to be a brake specialist. I just never took the state test for it. Um, and I did office services, I went through all the programs, learned all the computer programs. You know, but that wasn't what I wanted to do, but I was doing something with my time. And then I, I realized that I have children who are doing this time with me. And so the last time I was in prison, I, I realized I can't come back to prison. Because if I come back one more time, my kids will come back too. And when I realized that, I woke up. I said, no more of this. I deserve better than this. Mm -hmm. My children deserve better than this. That's what woke me up. So it's a number of things, but the main thing that woke me up was my children. Mm -hmm. My children did not deserve to be locked up with me or to one day be locked up on their own. Mm -hmm. My children deserve better than that. I deserve better than that. You deserve better than that. So that's what woke me up. Thank you. Same question. So similar to Tanasha, um, you know, my moment of awakening I'm sorry, I'm trying not to do this. Okay. You know, what we can't talk about, laugh about, or cry about owns us, so.
excuse me. Uh, so similar to Tanasha, my moment of awakening happened in the shoe when I had no one left to fight but myself. And all those psycho-emotional, you know, some people may call them demons, afflictions, what have you, that, you know, the stories that I was buying into about who I had to be or who I should be, right? Um, and so it took me stop to, it took me no longer shooting all over myself and over other people to really question my motivations and one, why I was there, what had led me to be in trouble while I was already in trouble and you know, not being able to take a visit or to have some of the things that I had come to you know, um, wake up for every day and, and be grateful for because from a, from a friend that uh, unfortunately I no longer see, some of the words that he used to say that really stick with me, he was asked once you know, what was the worst thing about being in prison and he said, every day waking up and you're still in prison. And so remembering that and really having to keep it re real with myself and, you know, again, that, that fight that was happening within me until I was able to actually be honest with myself and ask myself really hard questions that were really uncomfortable, not until that happened was I able to have an honest conversation with my family, an honest conversation with myself about how I even ended up there in the first place. Um, and it wasn't an overnight thing, right? You know, it's things that happen over time that uh, fly under the radar. Uh, and so having to w will myself with, with discipline to really think about those things and, you know, having been in, in the shoe, I had nothing else to do with that. I had no books to read. I had nothing after you count every brick you can. There's something else that you can do with your time if you want to. Um, and... You know, it, it's hard that it has to be sometimes to those extremes that, uh, you know, a person is, is taken to to reach that, but, you know, we reached it. And that's a testament to our strength and resilience and our humanity. Um, that given your environment, you know, any person who is in a really great space, if that space is changed to a space like the ones we've lived in and had to experience, and they would probably find themselves also having to make those kinds of choices as a matter of survival. So that, that moment of awakening was really having to start to be real with myself about a lot of hard things that I had wanted to forget and, and keep quiet. Thank you. What turned it around for me was um, after after about 20 years, finally having a real dialogue with my father. Um, growing up, my mother raised me and my two older brothers uh, my whole life. And so my father, he was in and out of prison. Um, he, had a, um, he had a drug problem. And um, I never really cared to know him because he wasn't really there. And um, seeing him abuse my mother as well uh, made him my enemy. And um, my mother being my best friend, I would see the things she would go through. And through, I remember there was a point in time where she would visit me in the shoe on Sundays, visit my, my oldest brother in Solano State Prison on Saturdays, and then my brother Drew in County on Wednesdays. Um, and this was a weekly thing. And um, when he came, he came through, and those visits can be long. It could be three hours, especially if you don't know the individual. And so um, I remember when he first applied to come see me, uh, I didn't know how to take that. And, um, and so I accepted it, I filled out all the paperwork, and um, it was really transformative because at that moment in time, we got to really sit down and lay the cards out, and it helped me understand where he's coming from and so that he can understand where I'm coming from. And to not look at this man as my enemy but to see him as my father. And that, that was transformative for me and that allowed me to open my eyes and, and really listen to this man's wisdom. Um, and, and that changed everything for me. And, and you know, when I came home, um, I, I, I had a place to stay now because before, prior to my release, I didn't have nowhere to go. And so we, we got to build a whole relationship after 20 years of just not even wanting to get to know each other. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One more.
more time for the panelists. Okay, now, now I want to try to, I want to invite the audience to gather your thoughts and pose some questions to the panelists. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do with the mic. So if you just raise your hand, Valentina has a mic and she'll come over to you and we can take a few questions. And then if for some reason your question doesn't get answered, of course, feel free to talk to the panelists afterwards since we're trying to keep time. But we really yeah. encourage anyone who has a question Please speak up, and Valentino will pass you the mic. My name is Pastor Tony Robert Jr. You know, basically, I don't have a question, or y'all have already answered all my questions. <laughs> and I am included here at the American College, so some of my friends that's here in this room and here at the county, and uh, I just recently had a thorough and take care of the room like this and do too. So everything that y'all said, I go through those things every day. And when I came to this college two years ago, I could not read and write, period. And that was one of my biggest fears. How can I function out here after 25 years of being in church? So someone suggested for me to come to college and learn how to read. And one of, the, one of the students up front here has been one of my biggest role models here in the scholar program here. And I'm not a fifth grade reading writer of four point four, but it's basically to the people that's here. And I just want to say thank you for a wonderful time in America. I think I was trying to be a little slick in the beginning when I was going to the parole hearings because I had no idea of what they actually consisted of. I didn't know that they actually had my life in their hand. But uh, you go in there, you sit before this panel, and you go through this process, and they say, deny. I'm like, OK, well, what was all that about? You know what I'm saying? They could have told me that for myself. I wasn't going home. I mean, I got my hopes up. And like you say, you went 20 sometimes. I think I went like about what was it, 14, 15 times to the parole board, and it just became routine. It was like, I just have to go, and I got to definitely go to the parole board. But I started tuning in to the political atmosphere that was going on in the system and started paying attention to why was I in this position. I was actually growing in the position, maturing, mm -hmm. and I started realizing that it was by design mm -hmm. for me as an African American to why I was in this position that I was. I'm not saying that I don't take responsibilities for my consequences. I definitely have remorse for that. But when I played the cards back and looking at the historical values of my own ancestors, like their struggle to where I'm at, and I'm like, okay, basically I'm just still sitting on the plantation. You know what I'm saying? So I have to be a little more smarter and a little more slicker as a black man on how to maneuver in this society. So I had to learn the undercurrent of the political atmosphere for myself and with my own peers so we could survive on a different level. I guess for me, um, when I gave birth to my first child, I knew that I didn't want my child to be caught up like I was caught up. So I had to learn so that I could teach my child. I had to learn how the system really worked so that I can 
teach my children, my child at that time, how to maneuver through it and not get caught up in it. So for me, I don't know if you've known this yet, but everything I do is about my children today. Everything. Every day I wake up and set foot on campus. Every day I wake up and breathe. Everything I do is for my children. So they're the root of all my aspirations, all my dreams, all my um, goals, all my accomplishments. They're the root of all of that. So for me, again, mm -hmm. it was when I had that child and I knew that I didn't want him to go through or to have to face the trials and tribulations mm -hmm. that I faced or not having someone to tell him, not having no one to, to, to guide him. That's what it was for me. That moment for me uh, happened after uh, several times hearing, especially when I got out, uh, some of my uh, friends would say how square I presented, you know, like a, a, a square, uh, you know, I had long hair, et cetera, and I was really trying to still play a part, you know, the part that I thought I needed to play. So I would hear again and again from people, oh, you don't look like someone who's been to prison. And that's when I realized, so what you are telling me is that there is someone who looks like they ought to be and prison is designed for. And that's when I realized that as woke as I, as I thought I had become because of my personal lived experience, that was merely the beginning and that it was not enough to just settle for a trail of you know, breadcrumbs that I thought were all the answers to uh, the things that I had experienced and witnessed other people experienced while incarcerated, that it was my responsibility to learn and research about people who do not look anything like me, who don't speak my first language. Uh, otherwise, I, I came to see that I would be no better than the people I thought were so privileged that were just seeing the world through a keyhole. So I made that my, my responsibility to use education uh, uh, not as a point or a source of pretension, which is what I had always thought it to be, but I wanted to be there. I, I really wanted to get through those gates at, so I could say I had made it. And now I had really I had to critique my motivations for coming back to school and what I was going to do with my higher education uh, and, and what kind of space I was going to create, not, not just for myself, because that's not enough, but for creating space with other persons who um, were throughout their lives denied that basic human right of education and information because unless you have all the information that's possibly available to you, then you're not truly having consent over your life choices. Yeah, when I first started learning about um, COINTELPRO, um, as well as the RICO Act, um, gang injunctions, gang enhancements, um, that was in community college, and then now at UC Berkeley, it's still the same, still learning, still digging deeper. Um, but I was, I was enraged, I was, I was infuriated, because um, as formerly incarcerated, um, we see the systems in play, yet we don't know too much about them, because it's often written in an ivory tower approach. Um, a lot of the research that we see um, don't have our point of views involved. Um, and so I've just dedicated my whole educational journey to deconstructing the whole incarceral state um, and then teaching other folks too. Um, because it, it's, it's, still, it's still infuriating, but it's a positive, um, it's a positive anger. It's something I can direct it towards um, positively to expose it for what it is and have real dialogue and real discussion on how to deconstruct that. I just want to just weigh in just briefly on that COINTELPRO. That sort of stands out veils in me. I consider myself a COINTELPRO survivor. And uh, the reason I say that is I could say that I'm a political prisoner because I was wrongly uh, convicted. But that would sort of, I mean, once you're out of prison, that means what you're a former political prisoner, ex-political prisoner. So I say co and tells pro survivor because that includes the whole context of what happened, the system that was in place that brought me to prison, not just me, but other people to prison and sent them to exile and some being killed. 
So I say that. But one thing I want to point out that when I left prison in 1974, there was only six prisons in the state of California. When I came back, there was 33. There was 40,000 you know, people even on parole in Cal to my California. I come back, it's over almost 200,000. So this, to me, was, was, it was mind blowing to me coming back into, into this structure, how, how it's been developed. The, uh, the hole that I was in was not nearly as developed, but they master how to uh, uh, make solitary confinement a work of art. And the first time when I came back to prison, I've seen fathers and son in the prison, fathers and sons. And, and if you have a conversation where you find that those sons were chasing their fathers and the first time they see them was in prison, that clearly tells you there, there was a design, there was a structure that was in place. The solution is just like the problem. It has both a political, a personal, and a social dimension to it, and it requires transformation on both levels. So, My words of wisdom are, every individual needs to stand up on their own spinal cord. Can you hear me? Yeah, you want this one? Hello. <laughs> My words of wisdom are, every individual needs to be able to stand up on their own spinal cord. And the reason I say that is, a lot of times we get influenced by those peers out here in society and the things that's going on, and we have that support. But once you go to prison, you don't have that no more. You by yourself. And there's going to be a time where you're going to have to stand up and make your own decisions. Even though you can come in prison, you can fall in line with everybody else, you can get into that routine, you know, and be that little token. But until you stand up on your own spinal cord, until you take responsibility for your own decisions and you're comfortable with making that, and you can live with that, then you'll be okay. And I think you got to start doing that now because life shows up for everybody in weird ways. And we got to make those decisions based on our own spinal cord, not based on what they're thinking over there, what they're thinking over there. I'm making this decision because I believe in it and I'm willing to die on that decision that I believe in. That's what makes me a man. My advice is simple. Don't do it. <laughs> Just don't do it. If you think the road to getting a better education is hard, try going to prison and then try and get an education while in prison, and you'll see just how hard it is. So my advice is simple, just don't do it. <laughs> my advice or my invitation would be for those of you, like the person who posed a question, who is aware that there are, in particular, probably youth in their communities who are, uh, in activities that are defined or labeled as you know, criminal actions would be to help find people, in particular people who look like uh, these young persons uh, who are in, wrapped up in these, in these activities that can assist in modeling something different because the more I get to know the histories of different communities of color in this country in particular, African American communities is that the spaces that we're born into 
and the things we're exposed to, that's what we know, unless we are able to see something otherwise, and how are we supposed to have that as part of our referential totality of what's available to us and what we're capable of doing. Uh, so I would invite people to take that approach because depending on the individual, and especially if they're like me, uh, you, we will do a really good job of not letting you know what's happening with us until it's too late. And by too late, I mean either a person dies or a person uh, is incarcerated for the rest of their life. So I would say do what you can to find them resources and expose them to different spaces. And if possible, persons who are from their same communities who are now uh, in higher education, right? Or a, a campus that may have a reentry program uh, where they can go and see that these spaces are not, in the past haven't meant, been meant for us, but are now something we're at and that we're taking ownership of uh, and invite them to, to consider, you know, and depending on the person, it can take one time, two times, three times, 25 times, but, you know, not to give up on each other because, you know, as was posed earlier, COINTELPRO was, a, was meant for us to self-destruct, right? And so if we're already within our communities stigmatizing each other, um, at, the, at that point, then that's, I think, where that process begins. And so looking for a different process of looking at us and our lives and our options <coughs> as, you know, our assets from an asset-based standpoint of, you know, being each other's resource and using, again, our social capital um, is, is what I would um, invite people to, to consider doing as a, as a means to help them desist from that. To start off, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, um, the lack of resources, the lack of opportunity, failing educational system, I understand um, when folks resort on the illicit market. Uh, I lived over half my life resorting to that market. Um, and so I cannot, I cannot knock anybody that resorts to that as a lack of um, anything else, right? There's no, there's no opportunity, nothing else. Um, but what I would say is that same hustle that you have in the street, apply that to your education. That same hustle. Like we we got to acknowledge that that's a hustle. And, and this educational hustle is, is the same thing. You got to be hungry. You got to get out there and get it. Uh, one, one of our scholars, he's a PhD student, JD, um, he did his research on, um, his research is called, it's the cosmology of death in sociology. So understanding how how gang members perceive death. Um, and the title is Live Life, Get Life, or Die Trying. And so living within that life, those are your three options, right? But if you go to education, there, there's a whole nother world opened up to you that's available for you. And I would just, I would just say apply that hustle and make that happen. So can we please give a huge round of applause to the panel? Please stand up.